go into the time of our worship when in faith we embrace accountability. Let us pray for this heartfelt prayer, aware of its purpose for transformation. Thank you, Thanks to thee, O God, for thy risen day, to the rising of the society itself. It may it be to thy own glory, O God, of every gift, and to the glory of my soul, my voice. O great God, pay thou my soul with the aid of thy own mercy, even as I clothe my body with wool, cover thou my soul with the shadow of thy wing. Thou be the Lord of every sin, and the source of every sin to forsake. And as the mist scatters on the crest of the hills, may each ill face clear from my soul, O God. Eternal source of creativity and mercy, hear now our silent prayers. To all of our silent prayers, let the people say, Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our Hebrew scripture reading today comes to us from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16 through 21. Thus say Yahweh, who made a road through the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who led chariots and warriors to their doom, a mighty army fallen, never to rise again, sniffed out and extinguished like a wick. <coughs> Forget the events of the past, ignore the things of long ago. Look, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth, can't you see it? I'm making a road in the desert and setting rivers to flow in the wasteland. Wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I will put water in the desert and rivers in the wasteland for my chosen people to drink. These people whom I form for myself so that they might declare my praise. Here ends the reading from the book of Joshua. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. <coughs> Thanks be to God for this glorious day. The gospel reading today comes to us from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, the village of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. There they gave a banquet in Jesus' honor at which Martha served. Lazarus was one of those at the table. Mary brought a pound of costly ointment, pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiping them with her hair. The house was full of scent of the ointment. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was to be betray Jesus, protested. Why wasn't this ointment sold? It could have brought nearly a year's wages and the money been given to the poor people. Jesus, Judas didn't say this because he was concerned about the poor people, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the common fund, and he would help himself to it. So Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You have poor people with you always, but you won't always have me. Here ends the gospel, the reading of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Let us be in prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Can you smell it? The stench. I mean the odor. Do you smell it? Shut your eyes for just a moment. 
Shut your eyes and clear from your heads all the beauty of this day. The wonderful banners, the flowers, the special people who fill this space. Just wipe the entire slate clean. Instead of this worship space, picture the town dump. Not a san sanitary landfill as we have today, but the town dump the way dumps used to be. See the rubbish and the rust and the rot lying exposed to the sun. See the pile of broken appliances, the heap of empty paint cans, the mountain of decomposing lawn waste. See the trash blowing in the wind and the big birds picking away at the decaying debris. The rats running through the mounds of ripening garbage and reeking diapers and the smoke curling from smoldering remains. Now with that in your mind's eye, do you smell it? The odor. Now imagine yourself living at that dump, and you can open your eyes now if you'd like. <laughs> Raising your children there, struggling to make a living, scavenging through the junk for something to sell. Imagine yourself so poor that when you pass from this world, you cannot afford a burial plot, and they just pile your corpse at the side of the dump. Now do you smell the odor, the stench of death? Tara Olson was a student at Bangor Theological Seminary when I met her. She had just written a wonderful newspaper article for The Open Door, the paper at Bangor, about her travels to Guatemala. And since I was about to make my mission trip to Guatemala, I was fascinated with what she had to say. Tara had gone to work among the people at La Basura. The, English, the word in English means trash. It's the name given to the Guatemala city dump the largest dump in Central America. Tara voluntarily gave a week of her life to serve families who rummaged through the trash in that dump in order to survive. After touring the dump and seeing on the distant edge what appeared to be a crumbling stack of matchbooks but turned out to be the deteriorating graves of the poorest of the poor, Tara spent her week working, reading, teaching, playing, and helping with the children and youth in that community. From her point of view, she was sharing love and caring, treating them with dignity and respect that every human being deserves. Tara says when Jesus knew someone needed care, he ministered to them face to face. For those who have eyes to see, what Tara did was a beautiful thing, but not everyone can see the value in her extravagant act. She said, Inevitably, during the nervousness and flurry of preparing for the trip, someone in my community would ask the eternal question, Tara, why not just send money down to the folks? Wouldn't that make the most sense? Rather than wasting thousands of dollars on travel and food, wouldn't they be better served if they just had the money? I mean, think of what it could buy for them. Well, no doubt there is some truth in what the suggestion suggests. But one cannot help but notice that these questions mimic the question that was on the lips of Jesus, Judas in our scripture today. The story of the anointing at Bethany is told differently in each of the Gospels, with the four writers disagreeing on several significant details. Matthew and Mark tell the story very near the end of Jesus' life. Luke requi uh, re uh, recounts it in Jesus' early ministry. And John splits the difference, saying it's occurred sometime prior to Holy Week, six days before Passover. Matthew and Mark agree that the anointing took place in the dwelling of Simon the leper. Luke argues for the house of some anonymous Pharisee. And John claims the site was the home of Jesus' friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Matthew and Mark don't identify the woman doing the anointing. Luke casts doubt upon her character, and John clearly states that it was Lazarus' sister, Mary. Mary, the spiritual one who preferred to listen while Jesus taught over helping out her sister Martha in the kitchen. In Mark's account of the anointing, there were some people who were upset about the money being wasted, though he leaves out the monetary detail. Matthew says those who became indignant were among the twelve disciples. No one worried about the money in Luke. And John makes Judas Iscariot, the one lone questioning culprit. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus' head is anointed with oil, a symbolic act, making him a prophet, a priest, 
a king. In Luke, it's not head, but feet. And the anointing with oil is secondary to being washed with the woman's tears. John agrees that the feet were anointed, but he does not mention any tears. And unlike the other three Gospels, John emphasizes the fragrance, the smell, the scent of the perfume permeating the house. We won't even try to harmonize the four stories. It's enough just to expose the meaning of John's version. Let me quickly set the context for you. In the previous chapter, Jesus is summoned to the same village, to this same house, by this same Mary. Lazarus is gravely ill, and while Jesus is delayed in his journey, Lazarus dies. An emotional scene ensues upon Jesus' arrival with, Lazar uh, with Lazarus' sisters lamenting, if only Jesus had gotten there sooner. Jesus is moved to tears, and here's, of course, where we have that famous shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. So Jesus asks for the stone to be removed from the tomb. Martha, always the practical one, tries stopping him. She says, he's been dead for four days. He'll stink. But Jesus won't be deterred. Once the stone is rolled away, he commands Lazarus to come out. Whereupon the dead man comes out, his hands and feet still bound, his face covered by grave cloths. Unbind him, Jesus ordered, and Lazarus is resuscitated, a foreshadowing of what God will do Easter morn, only on a much grander scale by resurrecting Jesus from the dead. According to John, it is this miracle which results in the plot against Jesus' life. Temporarily escaping his enemies by retreating to Ephraim near the wilderness, Jesus then returns to find the place where the stench of Lazarus' death previously had filled the air. Martha, no doubt still celebrating her brother's rest restored life, prepares a dinner party. But Mary, spiritually more sensitive than all of Jesus' obtuse disciples, gets what's really going on, what's really going to happen next, what will transpire once Jesus encounters his opponents during Passover. Somehow Mary perceives the torture, the suffering, the death, the hell, that will face Jesus on the cross. By the way, the Hebrew word for hell is Gehenna, the ancient name given to the awful smelling town dump just outside the walls of Jerusalem. So in anticipation of Jesus' impending demise, Mary goes ahead and anoints Jesus for burial. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume, writes John. Only the bouquet to be associated with Jesus' death according to John's theology, is very different from the stench connected with Lazarus' death. It is nothing less than the aroma of God's love for the world. What Mary did was extraordinary, extraordinarily loving and caring. Yes, it was extravagant. Yes, it was expensive. If, as Judas suggests, the perfume in that alabaster jar could have been sold for 300 denarii, that was equivalent to the first century wage of a full year for the average worker. But was that act any different than our sacrificing something we want in order to satisfy the desires of a dying friend? Or us depleting our savings account to secure the comfort of a dying relative? Mar Mary's ministering to Jesus in the name of impending need was touchingly beautiful. Only Jesus or Judas couldn't see it. The perfume's power proved repugnant to him, reeking in his angry nostrils. Why was this perfume not sold and money given to the poor, he decries. John claims Judas' motives were not entirely honorable and might be true of some who articulate such sentiments today. Leave her alone, Jesus counters. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Those words of Jesus have been misused over the centuries as a rationalization for complacency in response to the needs of the poor. Nothing could be further from the original meaning. Here Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 15. There will never cease to be some in need on earth. And now listen to the rest of the verse. I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. 
As the famous Duke ethicist Stanley Hauerwas comments, the poor that we have always with us is Jesus. It is to the poor that all extravagance is to be given. Mary had the ministry, the opportunity to minister unto Jesus personally. Tara had the opportunity to minister unto Jesus by helping the very least of these in the Guatemala city dump. We too have opportunity upon opportunity to minister unto Jesus by caring for those who are in need, living in love in the same way that Christ loved us. As Ephesians puts it, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So do you smell it now? Do you smell the perfume from that alabaster jar <coughs> filling this space in Palm Springs? Does it smell here to you as sweet as honeysuckle on the vine, as comforting as new mown hay, as refreshing as pine in the woods? Such is the aroma of the love of God acted out in the world through service. It is nothing less than the stench of death, being overcome by the scent of life, life abundant, life eternal, life in God. Amen. Amen. Now as you're able to reach out and take the hand or touch the shoulder or bump elbows or something with someone near you, let us pray together the prayer given to us from Jesus, using the words most familiar to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Secure.